as a director, you're, you are, it is a really exceptional job. It's super, it can be, it can be very fun. It can be really, really difficult, but it's always a little bit lonely because you're surrounded by a, a group of people with whom you have a deep connection usually, uh, and a common purpose, but you can't, you have to be very careful about how they're feeling, particularly actors, cinematographers, whomever, they have to know that they're in good hands and you can't always like share all your feelings. You have to be very careful about it. And, and so it's, <laughs> it's not about revelation as much as it is, I think about uh, sort of conducting. Um, and that's, and it's hard because some actors are smarter than you. Welcome to the third story. I'm Leo Sidrin. You are who you are, and that was film director Mark Webb talking about the challenges of directing. Mark Webb grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. As a matter of fact, we went to high school together. I remember him from the theater scene in our school. After college, he moved to Los Angeles and almost immediately started directing music videos. Ultimately, he would go on to direct nearly 150 videos for bands like Green Day, My Chemical Romance, and Weezer before going on to direct his first feature film, 500 Days of Summer, in 2007. The film is not called 500 Days of Summer in 2007. He directed 500 Days of Summer in the year 2007. Just making sure that's clear. That movie brought Mark a lot of attention in Hollywood, and he was offered the chance to direct The Amazing Spider-Man in 2012, and then a sequel, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, in 2014. I have to say that catching up with him in this context was a lot of fun for me. As he seems to be keenly aware, his directing career is the result of a specific and very personal set of interests and talents that he couldn't have planned for. In other words, what seemed a bit quirky and unfocused, a love of puzzles and logic, a family that prioritized science and math, a romantic sensibility, a love of books and stories and musical theater, a comfort with people, it turns out that was the perfect recipe for becoming a director. It's a good one, so get comfortable. Here we go, my conversation with director Mark Webb. I think the last time we saw each other was in high school. I think so. You graduated after I did, right? couple years. I graduated in 95. Yeah, and uh, 92 for me. So, yeah, a few years. Yeah. I don't think I would have necessarily predicted, based on the limited information I had about you <laughs> at the time, that we would be having this conversation 20 years later. Not yeah. that you can ever predict anything. Wow, but. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Well, you, you, your family was like the, the big musical family in Madison. You were younger, so I did, we didn't interact as much, I yeah. don't think. Did you have siblings? Or? I had no siblings. Yeah. But I think I knew your year pretty well. Um, from the musicals and stuff. From the musicals, exactly. Yeah. And also from, and I want to talk about that, but also, yeah, like, this is so boring for people that didn't go to high school, <laughs> but, but was like, was Mara Kalin your year? Yes, yeah. Mara. Mara was the sweetest woman, yeah. sweetest person. Yeah. I have not talked to her for years, but yeah. she was so wonderful. We all played bassoon together. Nate Hale, who went on to Juilliard, is now a professional bassoonist, who was my best friend growing up. And Mara and I all played bassoon. Then she dropped out, I think, senior year, because she got, you know, she was, like, bored. She got cool. She got cool. <laughs> she, was, she was always so cool, but um, really kind. I was thinking about this the other day. Like, there's the people in high school, they weren't really mean girls. Like, it was cool to be smart, I think, because of the university. And, and that was, uh, it wasn't as status driven as some of the, as like the clueless world that we were, you know, taught to believe high school was. What were you like in high school? I think, you know, I was a little bit of an outsider, though I don't know if people would assign that title to me looking back, you know, because I did musical theater. I played a little bit of sports, but I was not good at sports. Um, and I remember, I'm acutely aware of how not good at sports I was. I mean, I played football and I was a little bit bigger than the other kids some of the other kids, so I think I did okay at that. <clears throat> but it was definitely a source of assuming I would lose at stuff. That was, it was not exactly a confidence-building right. uh, part of my youth. But then, you know, I, I remember doing theater. I had loved musicals since I was a kid because my family went to Montana. We would watch these um, musical theater, uh, the Summerstock Theater in, in Montana, and I was sort of fascinated by it. But it seemed so outside. You know, my mom did biology. My dad was a math education person so it was very outside of our arena our, 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 our existence 
but it had always intrigued me. And then I remember doing those, and I thought people were very accepting, and it was fun, and it was interesting, and it was a very different experience than anything my brother had done or my parents had done. So uh, that I remember starting to feel a little bit more at home. But in terms, I think when I look back on it, I, I was pretty quiet, relatively solitary. I don't think I was unpopular. I don't think I was popular, but I think I was sort of yearning like everybody to be accepted. I was probably more sensitive uh, than I let on. But again, that may be true of most kids and whether or not they engage with that or they repress that is, I think, a big decision or a big thing that happens in, in kids' lives. It is for so many people. My friend J.D. Walsh, who's an actor in L.A. now, who I've known since you know kindergarten, and we collaborate still to this day. We 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 have our common reference point is high school and how the dynamics of it worked. And he had a very different experience than I did um, when he was growing up, and and that has informed who he is today very much. My memory of John Walsh at the time. Yeah. We were in Spanish class together. He and I, uh-huh. and I remember him being totally transformed by getting involved in theater in high school. Yeah, right. I don't know if that was already there and I just hadn't recognized it, but I remember when he started, mm-hmm. when he got cast, I, I don't know if it was in a Neil Brent Simon Beach. play. Yeah. yeah. And he, I remember he changed. I mean, yeah. he, he seemed to com- completely open up. Yeah. And then he was reading the announcements and then he became this sort of public guy. He yes. went from being kind of like a little bit of the underdog he nerd. He threw peanuts at the Madison Muskie game and like became this, yeah. Yes, and it, I'm, a very outgoing guy all of a sudden. It's funny to me that you bring him up so soon because in preparing to talk to you, I watched the second Amazing Spider-Man last night and he has this great moment <laughs> yeah. where he's a, this YouTube scientist. And when I looked up the role, I saw that he was cast as Dr. Jollings. That's the name yes, of the so character. Rebecca, our theater teacher's uh, last name. Yeah, Rebecca Jollings. It's, well, we really love and appreciate her. She was still in touch with her. She, did you take theater with Rebecca? Did a little take, bit. Yeah. She was this very cool teacher who treated kids like adults. And she had a daughter our age. So she was also a, our friend's parent. Mm-hmm. So we had that other association with her. But it, she was very encouraging and um, of artistic endeavors, which, again, for us who were starting to explore that was really fun, really exciting. And she, again, she took us seriously. She talked to us like adults. And I think a lot of people were really touched and moved by that. And she was always, you know, reaching out to kids who were not the normal theater kids. She took great pride in the, finding them. Yeah. And the, um, Oh, I forget their, their names, but there's a lot of kids that, you know, that she plucked mm-hmm. and forced into the situation. Greg Spicinger, for example, <laughs> who, um, was like a you know a hockey jock and yeah. a great guy, really great guy. But she, you know, all of us sort of mixed into this group, and it was a really wonderful, I'd say, transformative experience. A great, great teacher. There are a few like I thought particularly gifted educators at that school. Uh, Mr. Keys, I thought was amazing. I mean, it, the the passion that they had. I, I think about it often. Me and, too. And, and how Mr. Keys, in the first Amazing Spider-Man. At the end, the, the, the sort of epilogue, the last scene, the denouement of the, of the movie is a woman talking about stories, and that's plucked directly from a lecture that Mr. Keyes gave, gave us about storytelling. My family were readers, but they weren't, we didn't talk about books. Books weren't really, my dad was really into mathematics mm-hmm. and was passionate about it. And um, that's something that we were always given puzzles for Christmas and and that was part of the culture of the household, which I really value. And so I just made a movie about a um, math prodigy kid because that's like that is also in the ether. But books, which is where my life kind of moved towards literature, movies or film, you know, whatever hmm. you want to call that. Yeah, I remember it, it came from school. You know, I remember taking a writing class in uh, 10th grade and, and being really turned on by it. And, you know, then I like... Like I, did. Sonia Hansen was mm-hmm. my girlfriend in high school, and she made me skip school and read me Catcher in the Rye at the Vilas Park Zoo, or part of it. And it was, um, it, it, she was so interested in books, and it was exciting to me and new to me because it was not the foundation. I think about so many people who read a lot when they were kids, and I read a fair amount and was read to, but it was more. It was really the the, the household was about science, mm-hmm. you know, and and. Literature was just, it was a cool thing, but, it, and, and, you know, we were exposed to theater, certainly. 
but it was really about science and that other part of me didn't really wake up till till high school and I attribute that very, very much to the schooling and the school mm-hmm. system that we were we were in which I thought was great so after you were turned on to theater yeah. and and to that side of your brain and that side of yourself what did you think you were going to do when you left west with this kind of newfound love of the arts what you know what were you going to do I didn't know. I thought I was going to be an engineer all through high school. I really did. My brother's an engineer. I just thought that was like, I thought it paid well. I thought it was, I'd be good at it. And I did really like science. And I still do. I still have a real fascination with it. But gradually when I went to, I went to school in Colorado at Colorado College. It was this sort of weird liberal school. That's another one with a non-traditional setup, right? Yeah, exactly. And that was very attractive to me. Um, But I I ended up um, being more attracted to literature, to English and to filmmaking, it, it just, filmmaking seemed natural from when I was really young. Like it seemed like it's something that I wanted to do. It just seemed so outlandish. Because we grew up in Wisconsin. Like it's, it's, we were literally the farthest place in America from anything remotely media oriented. Uh, maybe there's some stuff in Chicago or something, but it was just not part of the vernacular. And um, it wasn't on the menu of things that you no, could become. No, not, not at all. Um, and people weren't even that interested in it. Mm-hmm. You know, there's those kids who are like into punk music, like, you know, Nate Evans or Cyrus Highsmith or mm-hmm. whatever, but they weren't, movies were not really part of the conversation. So I don't think, you know, I had wanted to act actually when I was really young, even in college a little bit, but I didn't, it just didn't click. Uh, but I, I think I wanted to give Hollywood a shot. I didn't know in what capacity. And JD, John, had moved out there and was starting to be an actor or trying to be an actor. Uh, did, he go, did he go to college or did he go straight to LA? Yeah, he went to, to the University of Minnesota. Yeah. Then he went to Santa Barbara. Then he went to UCLA. He had a plan. JD, John, has plans. But he went west. I remember he went pretty he went, soon. He went, he went immediately he went yeah. west to Minnesota. And then Santa Barbara. Then, yeah. Then down to UCLA and just worked his way up the ladder of, of good theater programs. So having your friend move there, that's what pulled you out there? I don't think it's exclusively what pulled me out there, but it was comforting to know that somebody had made it the leap. And, you know, we lived together our, our first few months that we were out there. But it was, you know, I, I don't know when the definitive moment was, but I can't, I cannot imagine doing anything else. I don't know what I would be happy doing. I, it's, it's, it's such a strange confluence of skills and, a, and, and, and talents and interests well, what are, what what is be. that? What is that list of skills and and, and interests? Is well, it a sensitivity? Is, is it social? Is it um, technical? I think there's a huge technical part of it, and that goes from knowing about cameras and lenses to knowing about how to put a scene together, how editing works, how visual effects work, and and having an interest in it and having mm-hmm. a curiosity about that. I think is really crucial. Uh, I also think an ability to understand the artistic process for a lot of people, for actors, for writers, um, being sensitive to that and being able to read people. I think it's really interesting. I think about like, you play jazz for occasionally. Yes. And jazz is a really interesting thing. There's so much improvisation, right? And you are vibing off these other people and you're feeling where they're coming from. And it depends on kind of on what kind of jazz you're doing, but mm-hmm. you listen to those old guys and like, there is a flow and that occurs because you are listening and you're tuned. I mean, you, you make eye contact, you flow. This is, a, this is a crucial part of, I think, being a, in a collaborative art form, mm-hmm. which film can be. Not always, but it can be. Most of the time it is. Especially if you're trying to entice a certain kind of performance from somebody. Understanding, you know, so much of my time in an edit room, for example, or even watching a performance on, on camera is trying to pick up on the cues that people are laying down, even if they're not aware of it. Like, what is the audience feeling? What is this person communicating to the audience non-verbally, verbally, cinematically? What does the shot feel like? All these things and having a sensitivity and a curiosity about that, I think is really, really important. There's also, you know, people, every director has a different technique. Um, and techniques and the hard thing about being a director is you never get to see other directors at work really you can hear them talk about their work hmm. but actors are always acting with other people and so hmm. as a director you're you are it is 
a really exceptional job. It's super, it can be, it can be very fun. It can be really, really difficult, but it's always a little bit lonely because you're surrounded by a, a group of people with whom you have a deep connection usually, uh, and a common purpose, but you can't, you have to be very careful about how they're feeling, particularly actors, cinematographers, whomever, they have to know that they're in good hands and you can't always like share all your feelings. You have to be very careful about it. And, and so it's, <laughs> it's not about revelation as much as it is, I think about uh, sort of conducting. Um, and that's, and it's hard because some actors are smarter than you. Some actors can pick up on things like Garfield. I remember would like, he, he would point out parts of my Andrew Garfield, who's mm-hmm. the Peter Parker would like, could identify unconscious cues that I was giving off about certain things and he could, and he would <laughs> you know adjust uh, his attitude accordingly it was really interesting I thought oh he's so talented at seeing things Emma was uh, similar but a lot of those actors are experts that you can't really lie to a certain kind of actor mm. even like I just worked with this girl McKenna Grace who's nine years old and she she I very I re- realized really quickly that I I may be able to withhold certain things, but you, it's very difficult to deceive an actor, to manipulate them, uh, unless they want to be manipulated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is true for a lot of people, particularly for, particularly for actors, I find. It seems to me that the comparison to jazz is an interesting one because you're working in a much more controlled environment. I mean, when you're talking about improvised music, purely improvised music, yeah. or even improvised music where... You know, there might be some composition or something that's kind of structured, and then there's going to be this area that's open. There's a very clear language, and there's an understanding about what the expectations are. When I was thinking about what a film is and how you're really trying to create something pretty clear, Mm -hmm. and yet you have to leave room for people to be themselves, absolutely, that to me seems like the ultimate kind of negotiation that you're that you're dealing with. Well. I don't know if that's the ultimate negotiation. I think it's an important one. I think that there are... I think about this a lot because I, I'm always trying to improve myself as a, as a filmmaker. And I think there are people like Quentin Tarantino, for example, who are, I think, are virtu- he's a virtuoso. Mm-hmm. I think he's so brilliant. I think he's a very controlled filmmaker. Um, I think he can think on his feet. I know actors who've worked with him who, and, and it's, you know, they, they can contribute and they have a license and, but all his performance feel real and his tone, his control of tone is just, it's people don't think realize how difficult it is. Maybe they do to, to achieve that with that level of fidelity. But then there, I think are a lot of directors who try to exercise too much control and their movies end up feeling rigid. And mm-hmm. I think this happens a lot to directors who have had success early and you know, think there you can have a sense that you are more important than the movie. And I think then people feel like there's such value placed on you as a director to have control. Yes. And control is a is a word that means different things to different people. Because control, I believe more in influence. Like if you're you're your brain is only accepting certain wavelengths and, and stimuli. Uh, but if you can open up within the realm of what you're trying to achieve, you can open up the actors. For, they're going to feel a stronger sense of ownership. They're going to start to behave like actual human beings. But if they are so rigid, you may get re- critics, I think, rewarded often. Uh, people on the crew would think, oh, he really knows exactly what he's yeah. doing. And, and it's like, yeah, but there's a lot of people who have a hard time making decisions who make fucking killer movies yeah. consistently. Interesting. And, and I, I, I can think of three or four names. I won't talk about them, but, but some of our favorite filmmakers are like notorious for being like, mm, I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't feel right to me. It doesn't feel right. And, and it's an, it's an infuriating thing to deal with as a, as a crew member, as a line producer or whatever. And then, you know, word spreads like, oh, they don't know what they're doing. But then the movie is good because they have, they're creating a palette uh, that feels more realistic. And, and how you achieve that is, is, depending on the actors, depending on the space, it's, it's, it's very difficult and, and really nuanced. And sometimes that's a tactic yeah. that you're, you're deploying in order to create a sense of fear in your 
cast or you know there's all sorts of tricks I mean Ilya Kazan was like the greatest manipulator I don't think I'm totally capable of that maybe a little bit um, <laughs> or I'm certainly not as good at it as he, as he is I, like I said before it's very hard for me I just end up smiling if right. I try to lie I'm like I'm the worst liar um, which is funny as a director because there is this expectation that I, I imagine that you're that you want to be holding some cards you don't want to be showing all all the cards to all the people at all times it depends on their capacity to handle the reality of the situation a lot of people are like just I don't want to know and, yeah. and, and they're they're very vocal about that I think there's other people that want to be your collaborators and it depends on how much trust they have in you That's Mark Webb on knowing what to reveal to whom and when. It depends on trust. I trust you're enjoying this conversation. Mark's first successes came as a music video director. That's where he was able to develop his technical style, his voice, and his visual relationship with music, or his musical relationship with film. And that's something he continues to play with today. What he loved about music videos was what he called the efficiency of storytelling that it required. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about was how making so many music videos, mm-hmm. which is what you did first, mm-hmm. informed your transition to doing features. And also, if thinking about music and just learning the visual language of music mm-hmm. or the musical language of, right. of film has affected the kinds of films that you make. So I guess the first question for you is... Yeah. You know, you may not have known exactly what you were going to do, but from what I can tell, you've graduated from college, and it like really shortly after that, you yeah. were directing music videos. Yeah, I made um, when I was in college. I made a sh- few short films, a series of short films called Kisses. Everything I have always done involved romance of some kind, hmm. uh, and it was four short films called Kisses, and and uh, there was there were four short films that all ended with a kiss in different situations. The last one of them, I shot in Italy. I took a Bullock's camera, cast a couple of random people I met in a bar, and shot a little operatic music video. Uh, I did not have MTV growing up. Uh, I was fascinated by it, but I, I only saw glimpses of it when I went. I took a semester at NYU to study film. Um, and the music was, it took some weight off bad dialogue writing, I think is part of it. I think because musical theater, it just felt like I really enjoyed those bursts out into song. And then, I mean, I was more into movies, I guess, than musical theater in college because uh, I can't sing. Um, and there was a limit to how much I could participate in it. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, right. What happened after college? I went, I started working for Doug Prey, who's also from Madison, uh, who made a documentary film on on Seattle and the grunge scene it was a music documentary hmm. and he had done document he had done uh, music videos and I started to watch music videos and I really got addicted to certain music video directors who I thought had a really incredible voice and style and and were very efficient filmmakers and I was like this is I just was addicted to it very quickly and, and became obsessed with it what was that voice that you were attracted to I think when I went to NYU, I expected to see a bunch of kids who were brilliant little you know, prodigy filmmakers. And it was just a bunch of dopey kids like me trying to you know, imitate Tarantino. Um, and it wasn't that interesting. And then when I went there, I thought, I, when you're watching a collection of work by a single person like Jonathan Glazer or David Fincher uh, or even Michael Bay, you're like, there is a voice there. And it is so, they're so efficient. I was, what, what, what struck me is how quickly they could tell a story. Uh, with imagery and by controlling the camera and creating a sense of uh, just creating a visual language that was inc- really sophisticated and very efficient mm-hmm. and I think that was just it just felt exciting to me it felt really interesting and I remember having a like I was maybe 23 years old when I did my first music video but which before, one was that? it was for a band called The Shame Idols and I went to Alabama and shot it, um, you know, I, off credit cards. And my mom helped out a little huh. bit. She gave me five hundred bucks, I think. Uh, and we, yeah, we made this little video, and then I edited it at AM Records. And I think it had a talent for editing. I think uh, it kind of just made sense to me how putting these things together. I, I've always liked puzzles. It's it's very 
I think closely related to the, the, a kind of mathematics yeah. um, of my youth, you know, because there's, there's computation and arithmetic, but there's also spatial awareness and geometry and how things fit together. And there's a whole other kind of abstract mathematics, which is really, it's about puzzles, problem solving and, and logic. And, and editing is nothing if it's not how these pieces fit together and what's going to create an emotional, there's like an emotional uh, component to it. I remember being connected to these things. But that's the thing is that it does have a certain logic but then it also has to have heart. And mm-hmm. it's interesting to hear you say this about the efficiency of telling a story because mm-hmm. not only are you dealing with three or four minutes, but within that you seem to also have found a style or a voice where you were very focused on performance and making mm-hmm. sure that the band was represented as a performing mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. and then developing some sideline yeah. or some secondary thing that would help reinforce yeah. the story. Yeah, that was, that, that was a survival mechanism. The, the performance, like I, I had learned how to shoot performance by watching Sam Baer videos. <laughs> and Sam Baer was a director that I worked for uh, in his parking lot for a few months but I became uh, really interested in his techniques and using slow motion and low angles to create a sort of heroic rendition of the band. You would not survive in music videos if you didn't make your band look cool. Right. But that was, and there was art to it, and that could be really fun and with lighting and mood and whatever. But I remember. And trying I, to find some technical thing in every video that would be. Yeah, new yeah and you're trying to be, challenge yeah. yourself or trying to learn something new or trying, it's, you're trying to master a craft. Yeah. And, um, but then stories. What was great? I think a lot about like you know music videos were very stories in the Aristotelian sense, like beginning and middle and end. It applies somewhat to music videos, though you're not obliged to it. You can be much more open and free. It's more like a dream, and yeah. and you it's a little bit more like poetry. It's not to say it doesn't have rules. You have to find that each video has its own language, and. It was very rich at that time. And also, boy, it was one of the happiest times in my life because, you know, every day you were creating ideas. There, it was like, it's like a sonnet. You know what I mean? You have, um, you have a, a four, you know, a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, bridge, chorus, chorus, out, you know, intro, outro, whatever. But there's a pretty strict form in terms of the structure of the song, typically. And how and you have you, that bridge. That bridge is really useful, I think, as a oh, director because yeah, it's... Yeah, that's where you depart. Yes. You know, once I understood that, I could sort of maneuver within that. I liked working within that form, but I could just always try different things. And, and the thing is, I was doing so many music. I did 120 music videos. So I was doing so much of that. And I had failed significantly a couple times. Uh, so much so that, like, the, you know, the label refused to work with me again. And, but then overcoming that failure... Um, gave me a certain kind of confidence. And I was like, you know, I know not to make this mistake, and I, I could make mistakes, but I was also creating it. I was the writer of it. I was the, the executioner, <laughs> however you want to use that. Uh, but I, I was the executive. I was the director of it. I was the writer of it. I, and I, Plus, I got to collaborate and listen to these people. So it was a really great time. And then I got fatigued, I think, in my early 30s. I just got bored. And my music videos started, I don't think they were as good. So what, were, what was that period like, let's say your late 20s, of, mm. of, of working and how would you be managing that? I mean, you, were, you, would, be, you would hear a song and meet with yeah. the band? What, what was hear that like? Hear a song. Sometimes they had like a brief, which was, you know, they want to be dressed in blue or they want to do something like this movie or, or they're just totally open. Like yeah. Green Day was always just like, whatever you want to do. Um, and my Chemical Romance had some other ideas. But then you go into a hole and just play the song over and over again. And, and this wasn't always the music, my favorite kind of music. I used to listen to soundtrack stuff more and maybe even classical music a little bit more than I did pop music. But I was always trying to empathize with them, to think mm-hmm. like how, what, where they were coming from. Because everybody took their music seriously. It was very important to them. It was a great thing about it. Sometimes I took it too <laughs> seriously. But trying to feel what they were feeling so I could be honest and true to the band, but also create something that I felt was interesting and, and cool. And I, I don't, truthfully, I think there's maybe a handful of videos, four or five, that I'm like, I really, that was a really good video. What are they? Then um, there was a lot of stuff that I thought was fine, like B, B plus work. I think my favorite video is one called, from a band called Brand New, 
uh, was the song called Sick Transit Gloria, but it was a very clear narrative story with a twist. And um, I had been thinking about it for years, how, for how simple it was. I had, it, I had the idea from listening to a dueling banjo song. It was a, it was a musical form. It was somebody repeating a refrain that another person was playing and twisting it a little bit. And I translated that into a, into a narrative. And then I was like, but it needs an end. And like all these things, all these great videos and stories have a twist, have a reversal. It's Aristotle, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the, the, you know, you have the uh, anagnoresis and the peripatia. Like you have the, the thing that, that shifts or turns and then you act upon that new piece of knowledge and you move in a different direction. That, that's what I needed to make that story work. And I felt like all the pieces fit together. I always effort that. I always try to do that in some way. Even if it's not a narrative twist, I try to have some reason to watch the end. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, but I didn't always. Sometimes I just phoned it in. Sometimes, like the standard trick was to start at the beginning. Like it was such a... Uh, I'd see it with videos all the time. People are like, oh, it's such a good ending. Uh -huh. Because it's, it, they just replay the beginning note it's like a cycle like that was kind of to me I was like that's what I would go to if I was um, if it was three o'clock in the morning I had to turn the treatment in you know at midnight uh, that's mm -hmm. what I would do um, other videos that I liked I liked uh, this video for all American rejects called move along mm -hmm. those are the only two that I can really think of that I thought Hel Helena for my chemical romance mm -hmm. but I actually think uh, I liked, actually, I, I do like, I liked that video, but I liked that people liked it more. Because mm -hmm. I didn't think it was a brilliantly executed video. I think it was that strange, but people really, a certain kind of kid really liked that video, which made me feel good. Uh, but I think the, the first video, I'm Not Okay, which was a movie trailer, I thought was that kind of a better, more original video. Um, uh -huh. But then, yeah, I had relationships with them and AFI and Green Day, a lot of emo, like, alternative rock bands, like, who... We all, like I was so different from them. You know what I mean? I was yeah. just not like them. I didn't have black hair and I wasn't a punk kid. But, you know, I liked them a lot. Do you think that the experience of coming into contact with those kinds of people... I mean, also, some of these people were big stars already. Mm. Did that prepare you for what it's like to sort of have to direct and deal with, you know, larger-than-life people? Yeah. I The celebrity thing gets uninteresting very quickly like I don't like th there's not a lot you can get out of a celebrity sometimes they're incredibly charismatic and they're fun to be around but unless they're a human being I don't it does not <laughs> affect me that much I don't want them I don't care that much if they like me or they dislike me you know I, I want to have a good positive working relationship with them but there's you know the bigger personalities I've dealt with the more difficult ones have been you know, executive producers, that sort of thing. Uh, people more behind the scenes who are, that's, that can be tougher. I also have had a relatively good experience with most of those people, but celebrities are just, you know, um, I mean, they're, everybody's different. They're all human. They all like want to be liked like we all do. And, and but I, what I do admire is I think a lot of them work really hard and are, are committed to a certain kind of excellence. They wouldn't be there if they weren't. And that's something that I always kind of latch on to. But um, in terms of like, yeah, that I guess suppose it made it easier because it is intimidating when just how people treat them sometimes and how deferential people are. And sometimes you can't be deferential. And that's, hmm. uh, I think people are, sometimes they're inspired by that. Sometimes yeah. they really crave that um, tension. It seems that it's, it requires either a certain amount of bravery or apathy. To that in the sense that when you walk into a room, I mean, maybe apathy is a loaded word, but mm. th the ability to look past it, because mm -hmm. I think I, in my limited experience mm -hmm. being around celebrity, yeah. the air in the room is very different when you, when a celebrity walks in yeah. and there's an expectation that a lot of people have and a yeah. lot of people have something invested in that. And mm -hmm. I think that the celebrity that can also become invested in that. Yeah. And for you to say, I, I actually look past that. I'm not really interested in that. And that, yeah. that, that doesn't, it's not useful in any way to what we're trying to yeah. do. Yeah. Is maybe a skill. Yeah. They're celebrities for a reason, right? I think one is the commitment to hard work, like I was saying. Also, they tend to be really good looking, and, but not always. Um, and they have the charisma, whatever that is. Uh, what, actually, more so with musicians, weirdly. But there's, I, I don't, it just doesn't, I don't know. Some of them, 
I really like hanging out with some of my. I, everybody's just different, and they're just normal human beings. Actually, yeah. it's like they're a little bit like cool kids in high school that if you brush the surface off, don't. I don't know. I haven't really studied it. I don't know. Like, I don't know how to talk about it. I actually probably try to avoid, if I'm being really honest, like socializing too much because mm-hmm. it I just feels kind of gross and weird though some of them are awesome and fun and you know um and good friends so you know it's it just depends on the situation you know something that i think about as a producer i produce records sometimes Mm -hmm. and i find myself in situations where i feel like i'm supposed to be the person who like knows more or is Mm -hmm. more in charge of or sees the big picture a lot of similarities i think i think record production and film direction are similar a lot of ways yeah and I get uptight about realizing that I like I may not be the smartest person in the room or the most talented person yeah. in the room. It is kind of riding on you. Yeah, I mean that that there is a sort of I, I was with Liz Merriweather who uh, created the show The New Girl, uh-huh. and I saw like a play reading with her. Uh, she's an old friend, and uh, you know I had just done two two hundred and twenty million dollar movies. She was running a big show on Fox, and th- we saw this play reading. <laughs> And the director of it, who was like, you know, worked in Broadway, theater person, was so confident. And so we, we looked at each other like, we're fucking idiots. Like, how come we're like, we felt like children around this person, even though we were handling things that ostensibly were, were certainly financially at a higher level. But the, this person was very smart and had a confidence that was intimidating. What I got from that is... There's just first of all, she probably just knew who she was mm-hmm. and knew what she wanted to do and didn't give a didn't care about being accepted the way baby Liz and I did. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> I probably shouldn't talk about Liz without consulting her. I mean, I think Liz is a total total genius. But there's I think there's something to be said for understanding your insecurities, being in touch with them, allowing them to exist. Mm-hmm. So that you know how to compensate for them in an appropriate way. And, you know, that's an ongoing task. I mean, I, I, I have so many like people, again, like they, they talk about directors having visions. And I do have an idea. I have a plan usually. But I, I don't always know exactly the right answer. And that's a tricky thing because people assign you that label. And, and I don't think it's like I say before about control it's not always about that it's more about sniffing out what works and I've man I've failed I've failed way more than I've succeeded I mean but way more than I succeeded in my opinion um, in my videos in my films uh, because of a lack of talent or intelligence or or whatever but I don't I try not to be self-loathing about it I like to try to be self-critical without being self-loathing and that's uh, that's a I think an important characteristic yeah. to endure so I, when you're producing I mean I'm trying to think of what it must be like I mean are you writing the music are you you're, you're arranging it sometimes or consulting on it it can be so many things it can be people that have like a very specific vision and sometimes I find myself in a position where I'm, I'm really supposed to be executing like this vision and other times it is more like I'm just going to be in the room and I'm going to try to provide yeah. as much vibe yeah. and response and be mm-hmm. reactive and mm-hmm. supportive and see what happens and we're going to yeah. respond to that you sometimes know? that's what they like you know, George Martin just died of yeah. course and like reading about him and his relationship with the Beatles yeah. where he was like they're the boss I'm yeah. just I'm gonna, and I, there are times when I definitely feel that I was like right. yeah I understand that Director Mark Webb on confronting insecurity and asking that all-important question, who's the boss? Folks, the Third Story podcast is a labor of love. I'm pleased to be approaching my 50th episode next month. Every conversation is significant to me for deeply personal reasons. With all that said, you, my friends, you are the boss. You are the boss. So thank you for listening, and if you want to hear more, let me know. Leave a review on iTunes. Drop a line at third-story.com, where incidentally you can also subscribe, listen to older episodes, or just look at the pictures. 
And now, back to the conversation with Mark. Here he talks about the differences between making a small, somewhat under-the-radar film like 500 Days of Summer and a huge movie like The Amazing Spider-Man, how expectations change the process, and how he approaches the work. Watching 500 Days of Summer, I see that film. I, I, I see how beautifully crafted and executed it, it is. And how, Thank you. And how visually interesting and appealing it is and how much of it is coherent and it creates a world that I kind of want to live in and and <laughs> and looking at Amazing Spider-Man and Amazing Spider-Man 2 mm-hmm. I'm watching that going I actually have no idea mm-hmm. how to relate to this yeah. even in yeah. terms of creating it yeah. you look at it and it's so big yeah it's so much larger than life I you know the Spider-Man movies I did you know I was really curious about them and they were difficult and they were challenging. They were great all at the same time. Um, but it was a very different way of making a movie and not necessarily a kind of process that I would go through again having done it. Um, you know, and it's hard. It's, it's a little hard to talk about because, you know, I, have, I look back a lot of times with fondness, sometimes with frustration. I think as a director, you have to take complete, utter responsibility for the films you're making. You cannot make an excuse. You cannot blame any other person. I think I, it drives me crazy when directors are blaming other hmm. whomever. And I really don't like occasionally, like there's, I get on Twitter, people who are trying to be friendly are like, Sony didn't let you do what you wanted. I'm like, yeah. man, I did what I wanted to do. Yeah. It's really hard. It's very, very difficult. And there are parts of those movies like the clock tower sequence in the second um, mm-hmm. second movie and the theme of the second movie in particular that Alex, uh, one of the writers, um, really honed in on, I thought, in a really great way. Um, I'm really proud of those things. And, and they're, I don't think people will ever appreciate, can appreciate the degree of difficulty that those particular movies were, uh, the, the obligations that they were under. Yeah. Um, but it was never like, I was never forced by anybody the difficult things about those movies were there's a lot of smart people who had a lot on the line and i felt an obligation to listen but it was just moving so fast and so quickly whereas 500 days of summer i spent a year in a room with the writers you know not a year i mean we worked on it intermittently for a very long time it gestated it burrowed itself into my subconscious i I dreamt about it. I mean, some of my dreams are literally in the movie. You know, Summer talks about a dream about, you know, running along the a moonscape. And that is a dream I had. You know, there's, it's, it's, it was so close to who I was on the inside as, and I was very proud of it. And it felt really good. Mm-hmm. It was terrifying at the time. It was my first movie. But it felt like my own. The Spider-Man stuff was, you know, I was trying to surrender myself to the material. I was trying to, do the best version of it um obviously and there was everybody like man garfield worked so hard emma worked so hard the producers were everybody worked so hard everybody wanted the movie to be good and there is a particular kind of frustration i think when you don't feel like you're getting to do your best work and i had i had known i knew what that was like and it's not anybody's fault and there's no like the people at sony were really good to me mm-hmm. everybody wanted the movie to be Good. It's just really hard. How much of that is a function of the just the numbers that you're dealing with in mm-hmm. terms of how expensive it is and the expectation of a film? Well, I like think that? for us, we, you know, we had we try to separate ourselves from the from the first uh, franchise, um, and then I think you know I think scripts take a long time to gestate and to perfect, and I think the first I think the movies are are good movies. I'm, I'm proud of them. I think they connected to the audience. They made money. They did, they did, you know, they did well. It's just like, I think people, and I know I'm, I expected a little bit more of myself, but you know, hmm. there was, and that's, that's hard, but it's also the nature of, I've had that sensation, the vast majority of my right. artistic enterprises. So it's not that devastating, right? but it's, I think you are engaging in, um, especially in the internet world, a series of expectations that are maddening and very difficult to navigate. Like, how much do you listen to the fans? Do, you know, how much do you listen to yourself? I'll give you an example of one of the difficult things that that uh, 
I encountered. It was on the first movie, and I was like, you know, we were talking about retelling the origin story, and I was like, I, I was, a, I thought we should because I wanted to do a different version of Peter Parker. That was an important thing to me, and I, and like, I think audiences tend to relate to characters from the ground up because you got to build their emotional valence and their emotional vibe. They have to experience what the characters are experiencing. But I was thinking, Peter Parker like got left behind by his parents. Like orphans are fucking pissed. They have chips on their shoulders. They're like they're they're not like sweet kids. And if you right. look at the comic books, he gets like his relationship with Flash is really tense, and there is a there is a angst in that. Steve Clovis and I were you know he's writing the screenplay at the time, you know came up with a scene where Peter Parker was. Um, in, before he got bit by the spider, was getting punched in the stomach, and like, uh, and he would line up, or he get, kids would line up and punch him, and he'd take hits, and he was suffering, he was hurting because mm. of it, but he did it because he was like, nobody can hurt me, like my parents, he's like an orphan, he's like, I don't, you can do it, it doesn't fuck, I don't care, I don't care. He I've was already been hurt as badly exactly. as you can be hurt. I'm oblivious, and so the journey of the movie was about self love and about like, and that sounds trite, but it was about him accepting something bigger about himself and that he was capable of of giving something back and the warmth and a love that he didn't think was possible and that was a very clear journey and I, I was very proud of the scene and I remember like saying like this suddenly everything kind of falls into place and I like how this goes and I went into the studio and they were like listen um you're gonna have a bunch of eight-year-old kids who are gonna go see this movie we have to protect that audience if these kids see this kid who they admire who they're taught to admire taking punches in the schoolyard you are going to you run the risk of them um you know trying to imitate him and like do you want that i mean that seems like a really insidious thing for a character to do and i was like well but it's he migrates out of that and then people some people would argue like oh well he also jumps off buildings like yeah, but that's right. clearly in the realm of fantasy um and this is, you know, I did want to propose it in a more realistic way. And, and it felt dark and Spider-Man is light and funny and all this thing. So it became, I, 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 I eventually walked back from that. And I remember at the time, I could only identify this many years later. Um, like that was a point of departure for me where I was like, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm engaging this in a little more of an intellectual way, not an emotional way. And, I, and that's, we would come back and there are great scenes in it and like, I'm very proud of the way the relationship between Peter and Gwen worked out. I thought the trajectory between the two movies was very successful. Um, and I felt I am proud of that. Uh, but in terms of the the character work and the, the potential for elegance, I, I, you know, I don't feel like I achieved that. And that sucks. And But I also, I mean, listen, I was a, it's hard. I, like, it's and I, listen, I think a lot of people really enjoyed the movie. I think the majority of people did. They, they were successful. Like people have a, a certain opinions about that, but they were successful. They did much. They were both in the t- ten highest grossing movies of those years. I feel I say sort of defensively, <laughs> um, but they were. They they did, and they they did very well internationally, and they did uh, decently well domestically. I think. I mean, I'm not really privy to the to the books, but I know they weren't an, they weren't abject failures. Um, but there was, I don't know, there was, it became less personal ultimately. And I only realized that later because I didn't, it's not that I wasn't, I was, I had ownership of it. I really did. Um, and I, again, it drives me crazy when people are like, they didn't let you do what you, I'm like, I was there. I was at the wheel. If, if you want to blame anybody, you have to blame me. Uh, and that's part of your responsibility as a director. It wasn't any of the actors. It wasn't any of the producers. It was the wasn't the. It was me. That's who's. That's my job. Um, and uh, and and it's okay. I can handle it. It's I can handle things. You know, it's it's uh, movies are really important, um, and I I hold them sacred. Um, but it is a it is not. It is a very as you say. It's a very complicated thing and a lot of people have different opinions about it and and you simply can't please all the people 
least of all yourself, all the time. <laughs> well, that's what I'm hearing you say, is that whatever perceived failures or, or whatever you say you want to blame somebody or if anybody's mm -hmm. responsible, it's me. I mean, the film was executed, it was delivered, mm -hmm. it was profitable, yeah. it was a yeah. success. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a failure on any of those terms. Whatever right. you're perceiving to be a failure is as much internal, it seems like. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's, you just want it. Like, again, I, the, when I did 500 Days of Summer, I felt, I, it felt right. And it wasn't a perfect version of the movie, I go back and I, it's difficult for me to watch because I'm like, I could have done that better. I could have done this better. And I know how to make this summer's relationship. I had always wanted to do, for example, like I was like, oh, I want to do like a flurry at the end where we tell the whole story from summer's point of view mm. and like a, do like a, like a two minute little flourish. But I couldn't figure out how to do it. That said, I feel like I got to go through my process. It, it connected to people in a certain way. And I, and I really appreciate that. And I think that's very closely related to my relationship working with the writers uh, and the actors and the careful, slow process of, of creating that film. Laura Ziskin, who was one of the producers who passed away uh, on the first uh, Spider-Man movie, very sadly, used to say, movies aren't made, they are forced into existence. And I was like, you know, maybe some movies are, mm -hmm. but some movies are born of some of love, of some real care, and they're nourished and they're loved and they're taken to, into the world slowly and carefully. And those are, it's not always a recipe for perfection. There are a lot of movies that are made in a ramsh. I mean, that's why people make those. They still make those big movies because there are a lot of people that, there are a lot of those movies that are really well received critically, that are massive box office successes that are crazy to make. Year of Living Dangerously, which is a great movie, I think it's one of my favorite movies I have heard, I don't know firsthand, but was a notoriously messy, mm -hmm. crazy experience. Right. I don't know if that's true or not, but I love the idea of it because to me it's one of the perfect, most perfectly executed movies ever. So I say... Oh, it doesn't have to be easy. It doesn't have to be... It doesn't yeah, have to make sense. I don't know if there's a correlation between the two, except for there is in my experience, personal experience. What, what does it do to your ambition or what you hope to do next when you've made th th uh, that have been released three feature films yeah and they just get bigger and bigger in terms of the expectation that's placed on them. I don't know like this the last movie I made was a very small movie that I, it's called Gifted it's a custody battle over a little m girl who's a math prodigy and um, it's really emotional and it's I don't know how loud of a movie it is but I think it's good, and I think it makes people feel something. I know it does, and and it was also a, sort of a carefully put together movie with a lot of where we sort of off the grid, like we, there wasn't a lot of interference. So in terms of growing expectations, I don't know if I feel that. I actually felt like I was completely under the radar in this one. It's not a property that people know. The budget was low, but it was a much more pure experience. And you um, were hungry for that after doing yeah, the big ones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to. F I wanted to be careful. I wanted to be cautious. Cautious is a loaded word, as you say. Like, uh, but I wanted to. Be, I wanted to be careful about it, and I wanted to be tender with it. Um, and I felt like I could do that. So I don't know. Moving forward, you know, I do some TV stuff. Um, I think it's there's process which I want to be careful about. You know, I want to work with people that are warm, and I find have a common sensibility big movie small movie i don't know you just want to be moved by it you know mm -hmm. and i want it to be i want to be more deeply connected to it i don't feel the a sense of urgency the way i did when i made 500 days of summer though it's an addiction it just is like you can't I, music i don't know I mean, you, you, it's what you do yes it, you, you can't i imagine spend a day not sitting at the piano or something no, but what's interesting is, well, like when I walked into your apartment, you have a piano set up, and mm -hmm, I understand yeah. that you're taking piano lessons. Yeah, <laughs> and I envy you mm. that you get to have that relationship with music right now. Mm -hmm. That it's not, at least at this moment, connected to your uh, right. profession. It's yes. just because you love it, yes. or you're interested in it. I mean, I don't know. I think staying in touch with that creative impulse can be harder and harder as mm -hmm. the expectations change. And yes. like I say, that's why I, I like watching you work it out on the piano. <laughs> yeah, it's I'm disastrously slow, disastrously slow. Uh, but I enjoy it. It's like it's it's 
it's a puzzle. You know what I mean? And it's meditative. But it's not, see, what I, what I admire about musicians, particularly those who can improvise or write or create, and it's a different thing. I mean, there's technical people who are just, who are executing and there are people who are creating and, and vibing. But the idea, to me, from the outside looking in, that ability to move and flow and release a part of yourself through a form like that so intuitively. Mm -hmm. I mean, making a movie is a hideous process of, you know, meetings and checklists and this, it's a, it's not intuitive all the time. It's a lot of it's clerical, but to be able to sit with an instrument and flow, I think is one of the more enviable experiences one could have. You came to direction through trying to find heart and technical execution at the same time. Mm -hmm. Those, those music videos were, were technical yeah. uh, enterprises, all of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you agree with this, but I think that that's where your voice is living or at least looks yeah. like it's living now. Well, the, the nice thing about the music video thing that I, and I, and I realize it when I see some of my writer friends are like, they get so nervous about directing. Like it's so easy. Like it's so, what do you just relax? You're so much smarter than I am. You're so much smarter than anybody. You're going to be fine. But they just have not had the experience, uh, and you got to be sensitive to that, I suppose. But it is the great thing about those music videos was I was always trying to do something different. I was like, oh, I'm going to do this whole thing like with a handheld camera. See what happens. See what that feels like. Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to do a split screen video. Like I did all these split screen videos, which is where a lot of the split screen stuff from 500 Days of Summer came in because I was like, oh, you can tell an interesting kind of story but you have to be very careful about what people are going to perceive and there's a lot of ways to mess that up but I had practiced that yeah. several times in you know, a Daniel Powder video and a Maroon 5 video figuring out how to perfect that technique because the other thing about music videos is music video can suck but if the song is good you're protected huh. you know it can be really uncomplicated but it can and have no technique whatsoever and there are many of these uh, and still be very powerful. I mean, nothing compares to you. It's just one shot of sure. Sinead O'Connor, and it's just so powerful, and it's a brilliantly conceived of video because she's it maximizes the emotional sort of center of that of that piece. She she feels and same thing with like Rihanna Stay video. Like, it's, but I was those became those were less interesting to me because I didn't get to deploy or practice or. And, and looking back on it, it gave me a, a comfort and an ease with camera work and editing and a vocabulary that I use to this day. And the interesting thing is most people are probably not aware. I mean, in the business, maybe they are, but aware of who made the video, who directed it, how it sure, got yeah. made. They're, they have a relationship with the band, but yeah. not with the director. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I envy that also the idea that you get to try it all out in this pretty passive way. Yes. And by the time you're putting your name on a film, it's like you have all of this yeah. language. This developed. is like, I mean, I don't know what it's like for musicians in this way, but, but I, I have a friend who, who wrote a, I remember, who wrote a book under a pseudonym. And I was like, fuck you. Yeah. That's such bullshit. I mean, it's great. Yeah. I, I haven't read it. I don't know. Maybe it's good. <laughs> I don't know. But like, it, I was like, ugh. You, because, listen, in music videos, your name goes on it. It does, yeah. Yeah, and, and that was a big change. Um, so you do have to take responsibility for it, but I'll tell you, like TV, it can go in and like sort of disappear into it, you know, and like you're not the, you're not saddling, you're not having to saddle um, or be saddled by all those expectations. Movies very much so, but that's okay. I don't think that you know unless you really fuck up, yeah, consistently, you you'll probably be okay. Though. Man, Hollywood's so fickle. Yeah, so let's talk about it. Let's 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 go there for a second. Yeah. Take Ryan Reynolds for example. Mm -hmm. uh, like people were like, well, you know, maybe, yeah, he's fine. I don't know. And, that, and he did Deadpool, which is, by all accounts, I haven't seen it. All accounts, fantastic. Tim, the director, did the titles for the Spider-Man movie. He was like, he came out of nowhere, and and like people realized, oh shit, Ryan Reynolds is awesome. We yeah. forgot how great he was, and now he's at the top of the world. You know, and can do anything he wants. I mean, that like they all have these moments, but then a year goes by, and if and who knows what's going to happen. I mean, it's like you, you you become, I think I become two things: 
sympathetic with people who have failed or in director jail or like writers that have had a bad show or whatever. Director jail is that what that's called? Yeah, when you when you can't get a movie made when you're you know when you because you haven't had a success a previously successful movie recently. Well, you get sometimes you can do have a slate of really great movies and then you mess up a couple times or you try too hard. And then they're like, well, he's not really, you know. And then you can't get, you're not on the A-list anymore. You're not on, the, you're not on a list that will get people interested. Or you can't cast the movie or whatever. So your your uh, virility as a director is questioned. Huh. I, you know, having been around for a minute, like it was very easy for me to be prejudiced ten years ago about people that, you know, you know, you know, his last movie. I would say that now I'm like good God who gives a shit. Right. Like on a personal level, like let's be friends. If you're cool, let's like, like we're here to support each other. Um, and I think that's probably more so of actors. Like you cannot, one, I have enormous amount of sympathy with everybody who's made it into a profession because it's an incredibly difficult thing. Um, two, you really have to be careful about making your self worth an identity too invested in that and that's a very tricky relationship because you you have to put yourself into it you have to make a stand you have to believe it you have to believe it you have to yeah you got to but how do you then step away from it and have a healthy relationship with this with this piece of work that is to many people a representation of you um and then and then um be able to step away from it and not take it personally, you know? And, and I mean, you are, again, I think for actors, it's a little bit more particular, um, because it's their face, but within certain circles, I know, man, I know when like a movie comes out and some people have said, and they're like, mm, I can see it in their behavior. Maybe I'm paranoid. I don't know. But wow. like, they, yeah, they're, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. And I can see it with actors too. And I remember, I, f- I remember feeling after 500 days of summer, and while we were making for Spider-Man, a sense of your all potential. You're like, oh, this guy made this, like, this one successful little movie. Now he's entrusted with this. He must be so smart. Da, da, da. And being like, this is I, BS, first of all. Um, but it's fun. Uh, and it's not going to last. And, but you um, didn't, did you feel any anxiety feeling that? Knowing that people had that, that they saw you as pure potential? And that there was no way that you could ever possibly live up to live it. Up to it. Um, no, I allowed myself to have a good time. Have a good time. Good. Uh, though I was under an enormous amount of physical stress. So I, the truth is I was part of myself was very shut off and incapable of interacting with humans in any sort of meaningful way. I, I was, the work was huge. But I remember like going to a party every once in a while and feeling like, oh, this is fun yeah. and cool. <laughs> Wow, and and now like because you know people in that business in that world a little bit more. Everybody's been through it. A lot of people have been through it, and it's like everybody's just kind of cool and right. end up being usually whether it's executives or other writers or the directors. Everybody's like, "Yep, we all know it's we we have all been there, you know." And it's kind of fun now. I think. Mark Webb on the ups and downs of the Hollywood life. At the end of the day, I feel that so much of what he describes applies to every creative field and every creative life. Still, what is directing? When is it happening? When does it start? Is it like improvisation? Do we know when we actually begin to improvise? Isn't all conversation, all thought, all imagination, all desire a form of improvisation? Allow me, if you will, to direct you to third-story.com, where you can hear extremely interesting people talk about these exact kinds of questions. If you like this, you might also enjoy my conversations with actors Peter Coyote, Andre DeShields, or with fellow Madison West High School alumni Peter Keckley, who founded Upworthy. But don't start listening until you've finished with this compelling final part of my interview with Mark Webb on when the real directing begins, how he defines success in a fickle business, and why he loves to use songs in his films. It sounds like, as a, an actor or a director, so much of your work happens in either choosing the right opportunity when it's mm-hmm. coming to you mm-hmm. or making it when it's yeah. not coming to you. Yeah. 
by the time you actually walk on set and do the the actual directing, mm-hmm. your kind of your fate is a little bit sealed in terms of well, the you say the actual made. directing. I mean, the actual directing starts long, long, long before. Partly in the selection, it's usually, but I'm usually developing scripts. I'm really working on them, right. you know. So there's that part of it, which is uh, crucial. Then there's the casting process, which is like the moment where you're trying to persuade an actor to do it, or an actor is trying to persuade you that they're capable of doing it. Uh, there's that. Part of it. That's a huge, that's huge, that's the biggest, that's actual directing right there, I would say. Half of it. Then there's the performance execution and the cinema of it, which is where you're just on set and doing all this stuff. Then there's the editing, and there's the music choice, and there's like, it's so spread out, and there's so many details of it. And um, so, so yeah, but the selection is a big part of it, the casting is a big part of it, um, crewing up is a big part of it. Um, but then on set, I think there is, I always call it, you know, you're sacrificing the abstract for the concrete. Hmm. And you have to take a certain responsibility um, and understand the limits and the boundaries and the, and the talents and the strengths of the people that you're working with. And, and there's a calculus term, you're trying to maximize things. You're trying to find, get all the variables set, identify them, and then try to adjust them so that they fit your ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to get this person to be as funny as possible. How do you get this person to be funny as possible? You make them feel cool and safe and like, don't make them show up at work at 10 a.m. or at 6 a.m. Like, you know, make sure they know the actor that they're working with. Like, just, there's, you know, have a drink with them the night before. Um, You know, there's techniques that are I don't think it's manipulation. I think it's just understanding the people that you're dealing with. And every actor is different. Every um, production designer is different. And every writer is different. And every executive is different. But you have to be able to identify. People reveal themselves to you all the time, don't they? Like you, if you are aware of people's people's language, which is far more complex than their verbal language, mm-hmm. the way they move when they do this, the mm-hmm. things that they don't say, things that they're interested in, like you can very quickly get a portrait of another human being and hmm. um, and learn to empower them and or you can learn to shame them it's just how you it's, hopefully people are more humane um, but it's it it's that is a for a director I think the language of people and the language of humans which is again I'm talking more about their souls I guess uh, that's a really important part of the conversation is being able to understand what people are capable of, and that's an ongoing thing, man. I I mess that up all the time. I like you know, but it's it's to me it's also fascinating. It's one of the fun things about it because when you're putting a movie together, an audience is reacting to all those things, and you have to try to understand what you're putting out into the world. How much of that is ha- happens internally with you? I mean, you know, well, what makes you happy? Right. You know what I mean? And work is a part of that. It's not the, it's not, it's very easy to confuse it for being everything. Yeah. Especially in a business where you're like, oh, everybody loves me. Everybody hates me. Like, you know, that can be, it's a very seductive world because there's so much light that shines on you in a certain way. But, uh, but yeah, you, you hope, I mean, you know, it's, it's like, it can drive people mad. Again, I think it's more difficult for a lot of actors than it is for directors. (laughs) You know, you keep saying it, and, and, and it does remind me of uh, something that we started talking about and that is still kind of looming for me, which is mm-hmm. that John Walsh, yeah. when he was still John, because there, he didn't have to change his, change his name SAG, yeah. for SAG, moved to California and, and was part of the allure or at least the reality that you could move there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you've just directed two massive movies and he has a very respectable career as an actor yeah he's yeah and he's a writer too he's written these uh you know he, he created a show called battleground which is the first show yeah. on hulu like he has a, he's a that, really yeah. good you know writer he's just wrote another pilot called the quiet zone which is a really cool thing wrote a screenplay um and he's yeah. he's playing the long game and he's and absolutely he's, but there hasn't been that moment mm-hmm. where you would say that transformative event where your career went from, you know, you're, you're here and you're doing it to like, something you're on that, the A-list. Something that John and I talk about a lot is like 
the you know people moving the goalposts like when do you feel like you've made it okay. and to me when I think about John he has a family he has three kids he's a I think a great dad and that's a big part of his life I'm like that is you you know you that's the kind of success that is much more powerful much more reliable usually than um than a kind of prof- a certain level of professional success so you know there was this story about people with really high iqs mm-hmm. in the i was some harvard study i forget what it was um but they're like the, the, they're like assuming the people with the highest IQs are going to run the corporations, are going to have the big things. Right. Like they end up being middle management people and having families because they're like that's what makes you happy. Mm-hmm. That's the most. That's the best barometer or best um, uh, a litmus test for what will make you feel like a more complete human being. Like there's so many like high powered executives and directors and actors who are fucking lonely and like and it's and they just keep on investing in their career and. And that's okay. I and mean, there's a lot of people that for whom that is where they are the most alive. And that can be really, really wonderful. But it's, you know, you just got to be careful about how you define that because it's very easy to confuse it. And so how do you, we're sitting where you are right now, how do you look at that? Well, you know, I won't get into my personal life too much. But it's like, but, you know, I, I feel like I care much less about a certain kind of success, financial, like... I, Big, doing a big movie like there was a t- like before Spider-Man I was like well, yeah I want to get in the ring yeah you know that's less interesting to me what's interesting yeah. to me is finding material and working with people that I that I really care about and connect to and can do well because that I think is related to in a positive way your identity as an artist and as a human like if you're putting something out into the world that you believe in and you're not cynical about it then I really really try to be careful about being cynical about things, you know, and it's, it's hard. It seems like actually the opportunity to get in the ring on that level at that stage in your career mm-hmm. was a gift mm. because you don't have to continue wondering what, what would have yeah. happened if you had been, you know, handed a massive yeah. film at that time. Right. I do get, I'm a little envious of my friends, uh, my director friends who are doing like the Star Wars movies. I'm like, that would have been fun. Like maybe if I had but then I'm like, then you get, I'm like, oh, that's I'm like, relax, Mark. It's like you you had your you had your your time to do that, and maybe I will in the future. Um, but it's, uh, but it is, yeah. It was a, at the time, a little bit more anomalous uh, for somebody in my position. Mm-hmm. It's weird. I think my career is so weird. Like it just unfurls in a way I just would never have thought it would have. It's just strange. Um, and it's wonderful and I've gotten to experience things that I never thought I would have gotten to experience but it's um, I sometimes it's di- very difficult for me to see the logic in it <laughs> for somebody who loves puzzles yeah <laughs> <laughs> I want to just ask you one more yeah, sure. thread of questions which is about music and film mm. the second Amazing Spider-Man film mm. you assembled this team of yeah. people to work on music I wanted to work with Hans and Hans is really responsible for that. And, you know, Johnny Marr played the guitar, who was also the guitarist for the Smiths, of course, which we used in 500 Days of Summer. So he kind of knew about me. And then Pharrell, who's a stone-cold genius. Tell me, tell me what, what that's like. What, like, when you, what he he's, that? you know, he just would, he would come up with melodies that eventually became part of the, the score. But he, like, he did this thing with Electro where he would, like, he walked, he, he was just thinking, and he walked around the block and came out with this, like, inner voice, inner monologue of, and he, like, just would rap, like, quiet rap this thing, which became the underbelly of the Electro theme. And then Mike Einzinger would string all of his, his string his guitar with, he's the guitarist from Incubus, who I also did a music video for, um, like, string his guitar with one note one like I think G strings or whatever mm-hmm. and would play Itsy Bitsy Spider in yeah. a minor key dun 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 which I think was what dropping the third or something and like he, he was these people who were so great and so collaborative and they all were very respectful of Hans like he was very much the captain of the ship but it was it, everybody had their talents and I love that sc- I love that score it's I don't think people will ever maybe appreciate it 
Um, had you had any contact with Hans Zimmer before that? Had you no. worked with him? No. No. I maybe met him once before, but not really. He seems to me to be somebody who has done so many films and yeah. does so much work. It's almost automatic for me to say, well, how could you possibly get something special and unique out of somebody that is so ubiquitous? Yeah. And yet, every time... He comes up with some crazy thing. I think it's because he's very open to collaboration. And he's re- he loves having other musicians in there. And like Junkie XL, who did the Mad Max score, yeah. was also in there, and like he's just sitting in the corner, and like he's his own kind of programming genius. Like, yeah. it, but he he just listens, he just accepts, and he's never satisfied. And he's he's like, oh yeah, all right, let's throw this out, let's try this other thing. And like, I'll get this guy to come in, and like he's just he is an engine of just he's just driving forward, and it's like so much fun going to that place, going to that environment was like a. It was a palace. You've done scores for you. Did you? You wasn't one of your songs a nominated won an Academy Award. Yeah, I produced a song that won an Academy Award. But everything that I've done, that oh, Ultra had, Lado del, del Rio. Rio. Yeah, yeah, thank you. The, motorcycle yeah, motorcycle Diaries. Diaries, of course. Everything that I've done, I feel like I am sneaking into the business over and over again. Like yeah, I mean, we. Sure. I, I recorded that song mostly in my house in Madison, my apartment in Madison. With I was leaving. No, Gustavo did the score, uh-huh. but then my, my buddy, Jorge Drexler, who's a singer-songwriter, uh-huh. wrote this song to close the film. Wow. And he was on vacation with his family in Madison. Uh-huh. This is a tangent, but I, that was at the same time when I was, tr- I was trying to convince Dan Klein to use one of my songs in his movie. <laughs> Dan which, Klein, who, by the way, Colin Trevorrow, who directed Jurassic World, and I were both PAs on it. I heard, were, you not in, were you not on camera on that film? I may have been in the crowd once. I don't think so. I mentioned to somebody that I was going to talk to you, and, and they said, oh, yeah, you know, he was in Making a Revolution, or he worked on Making a Revolution, which does not seem that long ago to no, me when you think about... No. That's was, a little independent film from 13 years ago yeah, or but something. But everybody loved Dan Klein. He was the coolest guy. So to me, like, I was at a point where just the fact that the song was in the film mm-hmm. was great. Was great. Yeah. And then a year later, it got nominated, and mm-hmm. we went out to L.A., and we were at these parties and stuff with... John Williams and yeah. like yeah. you know what I mean and, and the idea that I was in that world from having recorded this little song in my, in my living room seemed crazy and it changed my life completely yeah. but when I say I feel like I, I, I sneak into the business yeah. I mean that's everything I do is sort of like that yeah. I was just I get you lucky I get you luck is the residue of design so who said that I have no idea I like it yeah I don't know if you want to talk about Ternaco mm-hmm. why did you decide to change composers between the two Spider-Man films well, James Horner has since passed away tragically. Uh, just, just wanted to try something different, more. I wanted to be more pop. And James is a brilliant, was a brilliant composer. Had he passed away by no, by no, the time he now? was he had uh, yet. Um, but I wanted to a more. I, I wanted it less traditional. I wanted it more bombastic and electric. And I wanted to use pop music. Because I used so much pop music in Five Hundred Days of Summer, and I wanted to, I wanted to weave it into the fabric of the thing. And and James is a, a, yeah, again one of the best composers of all time. Um, but I don't think that was interesting to him. And and Hans seemed more game. What's the process of talking to composers like, and auditioning, and and then um, working? Well, in Five Hundred, Michael Dana did that, and he's doing my current movie now. Who's just greatest collaborator um he's um you, you temp music and i'm a big fan of soundtracks so i kind of have a good repertoire of things uh and then it's just mysterious because i i do use probably more songs than most people do mm-hmm. with very specific intention which also can be a cue for how the composer starts to work but you know, I, I talk abstractly at first, like, oh, this is the kind of movie it is, and it's like either raw or this is like 500 Days of Summer was about a storybook until it have kind of a magical quality to it, but it also feels real, so it needs to be analog, and and then listen to them and what they say, and like, and then you, I usually cue it very specifically, like I want this to start here and that start there, and um, you're uh, trying to, you know, navigate a lot of different things. I. It's about really truthfully, I'm trying to create in the audience a sense of the inner life of the characters, usually. There's sometimes tension or whatever, but like the normal cue is like, so I'm trying to say, okay, he's feeling this at this, or she's feeling this at this point. 
how do you express that? What does that mean to you? And then they'll they'll do it, and and they have their own bag of tricks and whatever. And and then it's just a process. And like you know, the Spider Man two score took months and months and months and months to do, um, and was really intricate. Um, and I'm so I think it's so cool. There's so many great parts of it, and Hans and those guys just killed it. There's so many layers. I mean, we just we talk about everything, like just that itsy bitsy spider thing, yeah. like no one ever know. And like we cued like the cold uh, Purcell opera for yeah. like, the cold song was became part of the became a cue for it because it, I, there were so many influences that we were conscious of as going into it. And whereas there's other things that are just simpler, that are quieter, that are just there to create a sense of of place and character. Um, you said earlier, sometimes you feel like music does a better job or is a welcome relief from bad dialogue, something along those lines. <laughs> yeah. And you think, not that there was bad dialogue at all in 500 mm-hmm. Days of Summer, but there were these moments where you just kind of got Regina Spector kind of yeah. telling you what's Yeah, uh, and Regina's feel. another person who I did a bunch of music videos for and I really love. And like, she also tells stories in her songs. And that was like, I knew I was going to use those songs. And we wrote around those songs. I don't know that score, lyricless score, would have ever achieved what it achieved when you left this space yeah. to hear Regina come kind of as the Greek chorus telling you absolutely and I I said this many times before but often you can say lyrically you can be more textual you can be more overt in what you're saying and what lyrics are saying than you can be in dialogue you know like there's a few times in five days of summer like we use a dove song there goes the fear it's like that's what's happening to them that's the subtext of the scene and he's saying it explicitly in the lyrics I in in Regina Spector I'm the hero of the story I don't need to be saved like that's what brings us into the reality expectations song or the story of us like it just it applies so perfectly lyrically like if you're listening to the lyrics it helps you understand the movie better and if you don't it creates the feeling that you're trying to to achieve so that uh, I try to be very careful about the music selection and you know we'll see how that I mean I I don't like I know when I one of the reasons I hired James James Horner on the first movie was because I did I wanted to move away from that Mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be you know rooted in a specific time or specific I just wanted to try something else yeah. like I did my music videos you know what I mean I'm just, you know, maybe I'll fail maybe not but the, that I need to to learn how this new thing might work yep I really respect that you take that attitude with you as things scale up that you still t- <laughs> basically you can only be who you are you know yeah. you've got to bring your sensibility to all of it yeah it's tricky but it's fun I mean what else are you going to do really I mean, your soul kind of dies if you don't do that, right? To a certain degree. But it is a job. Then you have obligations, man. Then you have to, like, then you have a mortgage to pay and, like, all this other thing. And you got to, like, I mean, that's part of it, too. I remember I talked to, I was debating whether or not to do a music video. Recently? Was, no, this is years ago. Yeah. I talked to my, one of my friends who was a teacher. And I was like, yeah, you know, I don't know if I'm really crazy about the song. And, da, 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 da. <laughs> and so she's, she's like, Shut the fuck up. Like, if you have, like, it's your job. Go, like, do you think I want to, like, grade papers at 5 p.m.? Like, I like a lot of my job, but it's, like, it's a job. Relax. But I think that a lot of people on the outside, you know, as viewers, spectators, fans, whatever, you know, don't really think about it in those terms. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think, you know, you talk about it a few times. Actors really get punished for it one way or the other. But you, sometimes you are just trying to pay the mortgage, yeah. you know? Yeah. And this is what you do. Yeah, and it's hard because people view, as they should, they view, sometimes it's entertainment, but a lot of times they view it as sacred, and it's an art form, and it's what, I know for, for me, movies growing up saved my life, but it, it made my life worth living. Like, it gave me what some people get from church, I got from movies, you know? And, and, and that, you know, I'm really grateful for, and that is because of the kind of, sacred quality that I think a lot of people directors actors writers creators filmmakers producers executives whomever approach the filmmaking process with and it's art and commerce it's the it's yeah. it's, it's always that there's always that tension is. yeah Mark thank you so much thank for taking you. time this is really fun it was great I haven't done me. an interview in a really long time I feel loose though it's good good that's what I was hoping for There it was, Mark Webb, film director by Coastal Puzzle Master, theater geek. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Not just any episode, but my 50th. There's something to celebrate. I'll talk to you soon.